Uh, my name is Dr. Wesley Kendall. Uh, I am the Director of Industry Engagement for the Center of, uh, for SITPA, right, which is uh, the Center of International Trade and Business uh, in Asia. Uh, this is a research center in uh, James Cook University. And uh, we invite not only your participation here today vocally, uh, but at the end of this, in terms of outcomes from today's panel discussion, we'll be collecting data and information from each of you uh, that we will use to prepare an analytical white paper that will be distributed uh, to all of our various stakeholders. Uh, so without further ado, uh, let me introduce our uh, chancellor. He was uh, a distinguished Australian diplomat spanning four decades of service. Most recently, he served as Australia's ambassador to the Philippines from January of 2012 to uh, January of 2016. Uh, he was also the Australian ambassador to Vietnam, uh, the deputy high commissioner to the United Kingdom, and he was the consul general uh, to Hong Kong and Macau, uh, and the high commissioner to Sri Lanka and the Maldives, as well as the deputy uh, Deputy High Commissioner to India. So everyone give a round of applause to our very esteemed <laughs> Ambassador Bill, uh, who will serve as the moderator today. So let's talk about the panelists. And we, we've assembled here a veritable who's who of Singapore business. Uh, let's begin with uh, Victor Mills, uh, an old friend of ours, a Singaporean citizen uh, and the chief executive of the Singapore International Chamber of Commerce, which he has led for four years now. Uh, the Singapore uh, International Chamber of Commerce, it may interest you to know, was founded in 1837. Uh, it is Singapore's most inclusive and longest serving uh, business association. It has 600 member companies that represent more than 20 sectors and 40 nationalities. Victor, thank you for coming. We're happy to have you here. Everyone give a round of applause to Victor. Uh, next we have uh, Mr. Barathon, the CEO of the Singapore Indian Chamber of Commerce, uh, who we are proud, as SITPA, we are proud to recognize uh, as forming a partnership. Several months ago, we signed uh, a memorandum of understanding, SITPA, James Cook University, and the uh, the Singapore Indian Chamber of Commerce, and we look forward to many more productive events like this in the future and many more collaborative uh, associations. Uh, to read you uh, part of his uh, incredible CV, he was reappointed the Chief Executive Officer uh, of the Chamber in 2018, having served before as the CEO from July of 2013 to June of 2014. Uh, during his previous stint, uh, with the chamber, he was also appointed vice president uh, of the Southeast uh, Asia Business Group and a member of the Community Engagement Program. And prior to his uh, reappointment as CEO, uh, Mr. Barathon served as the chief executive officer of the Singapore Indian Development Association from July of 2014 to 2018. So, Mr. Barathon, thank you for coming here today, and we welcome your participation. I'd also like to talk about, just for a moment, Mr. Azrul Shah, who is the Executive Director of the Singapore Malay Chambers of Commerce and Industry. Welcome, sir. Uh, as the Executive uh, Director, Azrul is responsible for the day-to-day -day operations of the Chamber, uh, whilst ensuring that the overall strategic plan and vision of the Chamber is achieved. He believes strongly uh, in developing internal resources uh, and capabilities so as to become a competent organization capable of pushing the envelope and finding new and exciting programs. And in his spare time, he coaches football. He coaches football. We've got a good panel up here, don't we? Give him a hand. Uh, and, and lastly, I would like to talk about uh, engineer Dr. Michael Tang. Uh, Dr. Tang is currently an Assistant Secretary General 
of Singapore Manufacturing Federation. Uh, Dr. Tang is the author of the best-selling book, Corporate Turnaround, Nursing a Sick Company Back to Health. Uh, he has authored more than 27 management books, mainly in productivity and innovation topics. Uh, business model innovation, introduction implementation. Uh, he has more than 30 years of experience leading corporate and business model transformation in the Asia Pacific region. Can we all give a hand to our panelists here? Hmm? And how could I forget? How could I forget John Dick? <laughs> John Dick is an old friend of SIPA and James Cook University. He was with us at the beginning uh, in our infancy, which was six months ago, right? So John Dick has been a terrific supporter and partner of SIPA. Uh, John Dick is a partner uh, in the Denton Roddick Energy Practice. Yeah? Uh, he is the AusCham Singapore Honorary Secretary, past president and life member, AusCham ASEAN, uh, treasurer and AusCham Vietnam past president and life member. Uh, John Dick has practiced as an international lawyer in Southeast Asia for almost 30 years. It's an incredible achievement. His legal practice has been focused on foreign investment in ASEAN countries, especially Indonesia and Vietnam with an emphasis on energy, resources, and infrastructure. So that rounds out what I think is a incredibly spectacular day is here today and I leave it to our honorable Chancellor Ambassador Bill to lead up the questions that will follow and again I encourage all of your participation in the discussion going forward okay let's give a hand to uh, our participants here thank you thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction dr. Kendall Distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's uh, really a great pleasure for me to be here as uh, panel moderator in the company of what you know now, if you didn't before know, to be a very distinguished uh, panel of experts. This session is going to explore two key questions, and I'll repeat them at the end of my opening remarks, and in doing so, to focus on the relevance of chambers in the 21st century. Um, as you may have gathered, I had the good fortune of spending nearly four decades uh, contributing to the formulation and execution uh, of Australia's foreign uh, trade and development assistance policies uh, and uh, as a member of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. And I got to represent uh, my country and promote its interests in eight uh, overseas countries long term and in many others short term, being, if you like, a salesman uh, for a very good product. And that's our country, uh, the longest enduring, demo one of the longest uh, enduring democracies in the world. In the course of that career, uh, I had a lot of dealings with Australian Chambers of Commerce and others Chambers of Commerce too, and sometimes the Australian ones, uh, as you would, may have experienced, were joint with New Zealanders. I grew uh, in that uh, career to have a very high regard for them. Uh, for Australian business people, an active, uh, well-supported and well-connected chamber uh, can uh, provide a much more powerful voice uh, than is possible for each individual business person or firm. In other words, a collective voice uh, of Australian business concerns. As an uh, Australian representative abroad, uh, especially for ambassadors and high commissioners, uh, their deputies and their senior trade and investment commissioners, uh, promote, one of uh, our biggest duties was always uh, promoting Australia's commercial interests. Uh, that involves, among other things, high-level advocacy with host uh, authorities in support of business ventures and also in support of host country policy settings uh, which are favourable to the pursuit of Australian business interests. Um, like many things, the word diplomat conjures up different things to people uh, in the wider community, but a diplomat isn't somebody who spends their life being nice to other people, they're somebody who spends their life trying to promote the broad interests of the country that they represent. That's not always being nice to people. So such advocacy is so much more powerful, let me promise you, and so much more persuasive uh, when you say with conviction uh, that you know what is in the best interests of your Australian business community or on particular issues or in a general sense, you know this because your Chamber of Commerce has told you this and they are well, well posted, well placed 
as an authentic voice of the collective interests and needs of the Australian business community. There's another way, uh, too, in which um, chambers are great multipliers. It's impossible to stay in contact, to stay in contact, any of us, uh, the High Commissioner here, the Ambassador in na neighbouring countries, it's just impossible to stay in touch with every single Australian business. So a Chamber of Commerce is an enormous advantage uh, to an Australian diplomat uh, or ambassador as it makes the job of staying in touch with the Australian business community so much more manageable. So look, to the extent that I can be objective about the reverse side of that relationship, I, I do feel confident that Australian businesses and Australian chambers uh, also see great value in having a strong relationship with the Australian official representation, including, I was rather surprised to find, in uh, very, very uh, market-oriented uh, economies like Hong Kong, where I served. So look, when my uh, diplomatic career was over, I had the incredibly good fortune to return to my alma mater to try to help in my own small way uh, to ensure that it realises its rich uh, potential here and everywhere else. The first campus I visited after my election was here in Singapore and it, uh, it uh, holds a very dear place uh, in my life. Uh, I was most uh, impressed and every subsequent visit uh, has uh, deepened that impression. I'm very proud that the university is linked to, uh, into many important networks here in Singapore, particularly the Chambers of Commerce. So, enough of me, I think. Uh, there are two questions that have been sent uh, to panellists so uh, that we can prepare for the event. Uh, and these questions are as follows. And I'll read them uh, both and then I'll throw to panellists to see who wants to open up and if I can get this thing that Pinky's given to me to work, which is a very big if, um, I may even be able to access questions raised by the rest of you. Maybe Pinky be best off doing that. Um, historically, this is what I'm quoting now, historically chambers of commerce in Singapore have earned revenue by leveraging their business contacts and industry networks. In an era of digital marketing, uh, where websites such as LinkedIn and Facebook have created free online networking opportunities that arguably compete with Chambers' uh, core, value, uh, core value proposition, how do Chambers remain relevant and provide value to their members? And then while you're thinking about that one, uh, the second one is on average members' subscription fees account for roughly 40% of all Chamber of Commerce revenues. In the future, how do Chambers diversify their revenue streams, preserve membership numbers, customise membership services such as training and education and discover new profit centres? So who among this impressive uh, list of delegates and panellists, who would like to take first shot at question one? Off you go. Well, first of all, I don't think that um, platforms like Facebook and LinkedIn necessarily um, compete with Chambers. I think um, most of us use them as extensions or augmenters of our, our brand, whether that's a series of events or whether it's our particular niche that we believe we have in this market. Uh, but there's no doubt that um, it's not a differentiator because everybody does it. And that's our biggest challenge, I think, in this market where at last count there are 376 voluntary business associations and chambers in this very small country. So there's a real cacophony, there's a real fragmentation, um, and there's a, there's a lot of competition. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but it means that it's a very crowded field. And the way I like to think about chambers in Singapore is that we're really no different to any other business. We, we, we all have, whatever business you're in, there are lots of competitors, and we have lots here in Singapore. Uh, so th that increases the opportunities, but it also increases the challenges. Okay, I, I re represent Singapore Manufacturing Federation, SMF for short. And uh, what's happening is that uh, SMF itself has transformed, be becoming more like a national agencies. I guess that applies for the other trade associations as well. In the context of Singapore, the government is depending a lot of, on us to assist companies. I, and this has been announced. I actually came from the other side of the world where I was sitting as a council okay, with several associations, associations 
And today I'm on the other side now, on the sector side. And I, I can see the big change. In those days when I was president of several associations, okay, the secretary just take care of members and so forth. So the revenue mainly comes from subscription, as alluded to by Bill. Today, for example, SMF, only 5% of our revenue comes from subscription. So 95% of it has to be earned, okay? like any other commercial entity. And uh, what we do is, uh, over in, in SMF, okay, because of the funding that we're getting with the government, okay, we assist companies in terms of uh, consultancy, training, or not through SME centers, training centers, and what have you. But mind you, I came from the private sector. And, uh, and I tell you, I, I always tell my wife that SMF is like, you know, plan my 30, 40 years of experience, right? All the past experiences I had before, I apply them in SMF. Okay? Unfortunately, this is still in my career. I wish I had started earlier. Why? Because we have so many stake, stakeholders to handle. You have the government agencies, the council, your companies, and so forth. And it's very onerous. I used to run listed companies. You know, and listed companies, corporate governance are very tough, compliance or not. Now, I tell you, with trade association, it's even harder because you're dealing with taxpayers' money. Right? All you need is one or two scandalous cases that happens. You rock the boat, okay, the reputation of the, of the association is at stake. So it's very, very onerous. We have to make sure that you know, whatever we administer projects through our name, it has got to be done properly. And out there in the market, as you can read in the papers, huh, like PIC, ICV, a lot of cheating cases, scandals, and what have you. And on top of that, we have to make money. Okay? Because the funding is not 100%. Okay? Most of the TSCs like us, we know about the lead funding is up to 70%. So you have to recover the costs of the 30%. And that makes it very, extremely difficult. Okay? But it has been very challenging. I see a number of young people here. All right, do consider your career in trade association because, as I mentioned, I wish I've started TSC 30 years ago where I could gain experience. You know? Because you really, really get in the deep end of the pool and uh, you learn a lot of things okay? working in a, in a trade association environment. Thank you, Michael. Um, I would like to emphasize why, what Michael has said. Most of our revenue does not come from membership. For example, our chamber also issues certificate of origin, which are certificates which require uh, businesses to export and import. Um, so, uh, most of, uh, or almost about 40% of our revenue comes from providing services to our members. And these services, when members are given a discount, so naturally they want to become members in order to have some of the benefits of this membership. Uh, talking about how uh, the chamber cannot work alone, it has to work with the government agencies. What are the government's uh, uh, philosophy and government's uh, intent for uh, companies, local companies, to expand? Uh, so the chamber works very closely, and there are government funding to help the chamber to expand uh, businesses and opportunities to member companies. One example is our SME center. Uh, we have a SME center which is uh, funded by the government which provides uh, free advisory on how companies can expand their business locally, how they can go international, how can they adopt digitalization programs. Uh, and um, also there are 240 or more government assistance schemes and not everyone knows about it. So coming through the SME center is uh, first stop for any businesses to understand what's happening in the uh, local as well as the international arena. That's number one. Number two is that also is that uh, how they can partner, collaborate, or um, work with other like-minded industries to expand overseas. That's also a possibility. And also there are uh, ways where you want to make Singapore uh, ink or Singapore manufactured uh, products to go international. There are new platforms which are introduced by the government. Uh, the uh, SMEs or local industries are not fully aware of how to take advantage. The SME, uh, the TACs are one step where they could provide you the kinds of uh, connection, the means, the, um, and, uh, and also the last year, the connection. Uh, TACs are able to be connected internationally and through uh, TACs, they can connect to industries internationally or investors or partners internationally. Okay. 
Hello, Tess. Hi. Uh, Azrul here, uh, once again from the Malay Chambers. Uh, so just give a little bit of context on my chamber first before I begin addressing the question. Um, I think the Malay Chambers is quite unique in the sense that it represents small businesses. Largely, I think of all, of all the chambers around, I think the Malay Chambers, of, we have about 700 over. Um, and most of our businesses, uh, being an ethnocentric chamber, most of our businesses are in F&B and retail, actually front-facing type of businesses. So that's a little bit of context about my, my chamber per se. Um, I think the other panelists have really covered the question about how uh, we account for the extra revenue since membership, uh, membership fees are, uh, actually don't make up uh, a big percentage of our revenue. So I think that's been covered. Maybe I can speak a little bit more about relevance. Um, I think that was one of my main questions. Uh, before I even started in in this field, right? Like, how are chambers still relevant anyway? You know, having grown up probably uh, through tertiary where there was Facebook, LinkedIn, um, you know, I, I, I thought to myself, right, why would someone who can technically connect to a person uh, without having a business card across the world in about two seconds, just click a button, why would they need to pay a membership fees to be part of the chamber? So that was the question that I had and one of the things that we've implemented as a team at the Malay Chamber is to work on three things. That's pathways, platforms, and partnerships. So the chamber has to be more than just, I think all the chambers actually have uh, transformed themselves to be more than just a, a receptacle to network. Mm. To, you know, or, honestly, I've heard, the, I've heard the term old boys club many times being thrown around about chambers. Yeah, so we've wanted to reinvent ourselves by providing clear programs, so like what Barthon said, um, and we're lucky, I think, uh, for the bigger chambers in Singapore, like SMF, SICC, um, S uh, SICCI, uh, the Malay Chambers, uh, we are actually the receptacles that the government uses um, to push out digitalization grants through the SME Center, internationalization grants. So if people want to interna internationalize, then they do go through um, our chambers. Yeah, so um, that, that does help la, in increasing the relevance of the chamber. And I think beyond that, um, there's one other aspect that the chambers have, which is we are kind of, I wouldn't say, unlike the US, we are not a formal lobbying group, but I think specific to, I can speak for my chamber, we do act as a lobbying, lobbying group of sorts. Mm. So let me give you an example. So um, for the Singaporeans, I think you all would know that the Ramadan Bazaar, or sorry, they call it the Gelang Bazaar, <laughs> just down the road, it's going to come up soon. So that in particular is a very, for the past few years, it's been receiving a lot of negative feedback. For example, um, high cost of rent and the lack of halal food. So give you an idea, high cost of rent, a, th a three meter by six meter space was going up to $70,000 for the whole month. 70000 that's more than anything you'd pay in an international trade fair because it was left to the open market, right? So... As long as people, I guess people were making more than 70,000. So, but, you know, the number of people who could afford it was low. So what we did as a chamber was to actually go down, collect data, put it together in a formal way that, you know, businessmen sometimes have issues putting all this info together. And then we started lobbying with all the necessary groups. And thankfully this year, it just came out in the papers that they will be capping the rent and making sure that there's a certain amount of allocated halal food amongst what is served. So this is something that's really important and we do function in that, um, in that nature for our chamber. Very and that's part of how we, we, be, we remain relevant as well. That's a, thank you very much. John, did you want to say? To round out? I, I suppose from the Australian point of view, uh, we are, our evolution is slightly different. Uh, but mm. uh, I think the, uh, the underlying message that's, that's coming through is uh, it's all about relevance and, and your point of time, relevance can be different. Uh, uh, I, I know when the Australian Chamber started, the, the relevance uh, and each chamber in, with, throughout Southeast Asia actually established locally. It wasn't a, a single chamber that then established branches. The relevance was uh, in developing countries, mm. was getting together yeah. to share experiences. Yeah. Now, Australians do tend to do that over a beer. So uh, networking nights were I very important. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but things evolve. Uh, mm. There's, you go through that phase of its networking, then you go through the information exchange phase, and then I think you move to more the advocacy phase, which is exactly what you're saying as well. Mm. Um, and so it's how does the chamber adapt as its members' needs adapt? So Facebook and LinkedIn um, 
I don't see as a com competitor. It's a platform through which competitors mm. can grow, mm. but equally it's a platform for the chambers to yeah. utilise. And so the, the whole notion of um, it's uh, from an Australian chamber point of view, advocacy isn't necessarily banging the door saying no. we want change. It, it, it can be around making sure the right information goes out to the community in which we're operating yeah. in so they understand what, in my case, the Australian business yeah. community could deliver to Singapore or to Vietnam yeah. or to Indonesia. Yeah. Um, equally, it, it's, I, I think the chambers offer that ability for members uh, to actually put forward issues that are impacting individual members, but by, if you like, filtering it through the chamber, mm. You, you're anonymising it and taking yeah. it away from being a single business lobbying yeah. to being a, an issue of yeah. generic concern to the business yeah. community. So yeah. individual businesses may not wish to separately lobby on that, but they yeah. would be prepared to come through the chamber. And, and I think that's a, both a service that we offer back to the members, but it's also something the members see of value yeah. and, and that maintains relevance for the chambers. Yeah. So I think, it, I think what it comes down to is We've all got to get smarter about our assessment of what value is. Mm, yes. yeah. And uh, I suggest agile, Absolutely. able to adapt as things change. Look, that's great. I've got a few questions. Interestingly, in light of your comment about the old boys club, the first, <laughs> the first intervention, we're all boys. You know? That's a good point. The first question is, where are the female representatives on the panel? So unless one of you want to address that, um, we'll take that as a comment, but it does it, uh, the serious point here I would suggest is, does it speak to the question of whether we have enough uh, women involved in business and involved therefore in chambers in uh, places like uh, Singapore? I can see you reaching for a microphone. Oh, I'm itching to tell you. Um, I, I have to tell you that most chambers are run by women mm. in Singapore. Um, nearly all the, all the large foreign national chambers, and of course including Auscham, um, and Ostcham ASEAN are, are, run by, are run by very talented women uh, mm -hmm. uh, executive directors. Good and, I, and I agree with whoever asked you that question that we should have had women on the panel. Yeah. <laughs> it's somebody called anonymous, so I'll look for them later. Yeah. <laughs> the next question is by somebody who doesn't anonymize himself, but he asks, in a world where information is readily accessible, where buyers and sellers and traders are easy to ac access, how do chambers continue to be relevant? Um, that was Bill. Bill, do you think that's been answered so far or do you want to pursue an angle of that? Who wants to tackle that one? That, that's a very good question and in fact, um, certainly from from the SICC perspective, our members don't need us to do that because they're very capable of doing that themselves. Um, what they do sometimes need help with is to be connected with decision makers. So for example, they, they've targeted that they've got a new product and they want, to, they, they want to reach out to, say for example, real estate uh, or facilities management companies, they'll come to chambers and ask for contacts. And what is surprising in this uh, era of Facebook, LinkedIn, and all the other platforms is how important they, or the value they put on that connection. So they feel that the, cha the fact that someone in the chamber is connecting them is gonna be much more beneficial than if they did a cold call on their individual target person that they want to speak to. So uh, we, we see a lot of that in SICC. Just to add on to Michael's uh, comment, I just want to give an example of uh, uh, such a collaboration uh, where the connection with um, with uh, government agencies in different parts of the world will help our businesses to expand. Uh, two months ago, the Indian Chamber of Commerce led a delegation to Gujarat. Uh, there is a program called Vibrant Gujarat, which attracts nearly about uh, 30,000 
participants. <coughs> so we led a delegation of uh, 25 companies from Singapore, and we had the opportunity to meet the Prime Minister of India. We also met the Chief Minister of Gujarat. In our discussion, uh, one example that we had difficulties, we, the delegations were MNCs as well as uh, uh, SMEs. So we spoke about the challenges that we have in doing business in India. For example, we gave an example that there was a collaboration between Singapore and uh, Tata and uh, Singapore Airlines, but the number of flights to take off is not given by the government. And uh, we requested for X number of flights. Uh, Prime Minister Modi immediately says, we'll look into it, and that was given as an excess immediately. Another one was that when we met the Chief Minister of Gujarat, uh, there was another company which was having some difficulty in getting the land parcel approved. And we spoke about it, and he told his uh, Secretary of Industry who was sitting next, get it done, and the next day it was approved. So I'm giving you some examples that where we bring delegations, we need the connection, we can meet the decision makers, and things can happen faster for some of the SMEs or companies which are looking for collaborations in overseas. Okay, I just share some experiences uh, from SMF. For example, we have a program right now called the European Enterprise Network. By the way, this is funded by the government. It's to attract SMEs in Europe, EU, who wants to do business here in the Far East, and the EU Singapore has a base. So we are fortunate to be appointed to facilitate that connection and matching and so forth. Singapore is a very important uh, place, increasingly, yeah, we notice, for SMEs from overseas. You know, uh, use Singapore as a base and then go into the whole of Asia. So they always start in Singapore, and that's where this is one of the channels that we have. Now, within the uh, SMF itself, we are organized by 10, 10 industry groups, okay, because manufacturing sector is very broad and wide. So it could be electronics, precision engineering, whatnot. So within the, the group itself, okay, there are people from the same fraternity and community who can share you know, resources, and, and there's something that, that, that uh, we're encouraging them to do. Going forward, it's, it's really a collaboration. And of course, uh, uh, similar to the other TECs, we organize a lot of overseas you know, trips. Uh, my experience has been kind of similar with, with the rest. When it comes to Singapore, most of the members have no problem getting connections, because I guess it's a small country, where we come in to facilitate and help them is really overseas context. Huh? And that's where we can reach out you know, to assist them. Yeah. Okay, let's move on to a few other questions. They're starting to flow in here. Uh, or either that or I've just discovered how to work this thing. Um, this is a question. It says a 2016 paper noted that chamber agendas are often not aligned with what business owners hope to get out of their membership. Is this the case here in Singapore? The answer is sometimes. Mm. Um, and one of the challenges that all the chambers have, um, for, it, it varies of course in terms of degree, but getting members to actually share what they need mm. or what they want mm. is very difficult. And that's because everybody's so busy, nobody's got time to answer a survey. Often the only way you find out what someone needs is if you visit their place of work mm. and they'll give you a download of where their business is um, what their challenges are, and from there you can work out how you might be able to serve them. So I think that sort of having that two-way um, uh, communication is, is key, uh, not only to building increased relevance for the chambers, but to permit them to serve their members better. Mm. But you need the two-way street, yeah. and it's not always there. The next one, um comes back again to yours, uh, I think. Uh, w w how are the various chambers of commerce engaging with our millennials uh, to make their organisation relevant? <laughs> test, test, hi. Um, well, I think um, I can't speak for the rest of the chambers, but for a start, um, I think it's always useful to have a chapter within the chamber that specifically caters to the younger millennial generation who are starting in business. They are facing um, different challenges, they, are, they have different resources, and they have different expectations. So for example, in the, uh, in the Malay chambers, 
uh, we do have a kind of like a standalone chapter. So it's a chapter, they're all members of the Malay Chambers, but they're called the Young, Young Entrepreneurs mm -hmm. Network. Mm -hmm. So that's about 150 of them, which is quite decent. Um, as to what we classify as young or youth, we try and keep it quite open. Because <laughs> some people still do consider them young, so we don't want to stop them just because of their age. But um, yeah, so they are, they are, the platforms that they interact with, the things that they speak about are very different. And it's very apparent in my chamber, for example, because the younger group, the YEN, they are diversified in their business. They, some of them are doing cyber security, some of them are doing renewable energy, areas mm. that are not... Um, normally uh, related, related to the members of my chamber. So the older chambers, uh, the older members in, in my chamber are those in F&B and retail, they're second gen, third gen. Mm. So we'll need to create specialized platforms for them to, um, for them to interact and mm. to discuss. But more importantly, at the same time, it's also important to make sure that it doesn't get too disparate that they see themselves or you know we don't want to have anything to do with the older group which sometimes yeah. happens as well right so we do have sessions like these where we bring in the experienced mm. businessmen mm. to share with them the nuances yeah i may not know anything about tech but listen kids this is this is the reality of business right so it's always important to create also um, articulated platforms for the older businessmen to share certain nuances about doing business mm. with the young group. So yeah, I think providing these platforms are um, um, are really crucial. Very yeah. good. Well, I, I think yeah. uh, from the Australian Chamber point of view, we a very similar program uh, we, we were running a, a while back where uh, we were getting the younger uh, people in business around the table with a. Uh, a senior person from uh, an MNC or a, to, to give them that career perspective on the sort of things they need, would need to look to to advance their careers. Mm. Uh, so these people weren't necessarily entrepreneurs on their own. They might have been working for larger companies or working as SMEs, uh, but it, it gave them the access in a one-to-one, -one, almost one-to-one -one situation Does where they could benefit. Is there a reciprocal benefit where older people um, are learning about emerging business and emerging technologies by brushing shoulders with, uh, I guess, 68 would be too old for one of your youth? Um, yeah, well, yeah, I wouldn't <laughs> make the cut. <laughs> I just wonder if I'd make the cut. Um, that's if you, if it, I think if you talk about reciprocity, I would say that, uh, well, there's a social overlay of <laughs> this whole question. So sometimes the older businesses, I would say they are a little bit more reluctant to sit down with the younger ones as compared to the other way around, honestly speaking. The, the younger That's ones, uh, you know, they, they, they mm. don't mind sitting with the older businessmen, yeah. but the older businessmen sometimes, you know, well, for <laughs> do you, I guess maybe if they feel they are more experienced, so they, they have less uh, uh, desire to sit down. But that's where it's actually important to identify the older group of members who have successfully adopted the new way of doing business. They have started receiving funding, they are digitalizing their business, and there are, I guess, um, a small number of them. And they are so-called, I work in a traditional business. So we have this, this uh, give examples, we have this uh, man who's been running a travel agency specific to doing the pilgrimage. And he's so advanced that he's actually has incorporated AI where someone can go to his office, put on uh, uh, this augment augmented reality glasses and, and be able to actually visualize how it is if he was in Mecca. Like, wow. and, and he's like maybe 70 plus. Yeah, so what we do is that we then rely on him to be the spokesman to bring the older businesses to say, hey, you know what? There's still room for us to learn. You know, mm. we've been in business for a long time, but now things have changed. You give so me great learn. hope. You give me great Definitely. hope. Definitely. <laughs> for sure. Can, let me move on to... Um, there's a, oh, sorry. Yes, please. Go ahead. I think, um, like the Malay Chamber, we also set up a, a millennial uh, network. But instead of calling it a young, we call it an aspiring uh, entrepreneur network. So mainly 90% of it comprises of youth between the age of 18 to 35. But we are doing further. Uh, we are helping them to be mentored by someone who has been successful in industry. We will be soon setting up an incubation center to help them to spin off or to start up, um, especially for the young people. Um, I wanted to say about the women uh, entrepreneur. We have also set up a women entrepreneur network, trying to encourage women to come forward in doing businesses, 
and to help them in doing businesses. We also have uh, not necessarily women, but uh, successful businessmen to help the women to expand their business. And it's called WEN, Women Entrepreneur Network. Very good. One question is there are many reports of high turnover rates among small business owners in Chambers membership. What are turnover rates like here and across the range? That's one. Um, another one is the government, with government-led organisations like Enterprise Singapore and others, how do, how can Chambers of Commerce collaborate with them to benefit members? Um, how are Chambers working with similar bodies across the region? There's another one about the Old Boys Club, and I think we all consider ourselves <laughs> chastened. Old Boys Club. Oh, yeah, okay. To what extent uh, is there strong collaboration between the 376 chambers, or could there might be may there be scope for greater benefits from greater interchamber collaborations? So, does anybody want to pick up on any one of them? Yeah, S I'll see if we can cover all. I'll pick on first of all the uh, the turnover uh, perennial problem for. Mm. Uh, voluntary business associations and chambers. Um, I mean, in Singapore, it depends on the year. It depends how the economy is doing. But you're looking generally at anything between 12 to 20 percent turnover a year, because membership is an annual process, um, and people will opt not to renew their membership. Uh, and then, of course, you've got to run hard to make up any shortfall you may you may uh, you may have. Um, I also want to just quickly answer the question on collaboration. Um, there is a tremendous amount of opportunity for uh, chambers to collaborate more than we do. Um, when, I, when I took over SICC, um, because I was very much the new kid on the block, um, and all my peers were very well established in their jobs, and I invited them across to talk about, you know, could we collaborate and talk about common challenges? And the first meeting I held, uh, everybody agreed to come, but 10 minutes to the meeting date, everybody pulled out. So because perseverance and persistence are two of my middle names, I rearranged the meeting. And then everybody turned up and very politely told me where to get off. In other words, we have our niche, we have our uh, membership, we're jealous of that, we don't want to engage. So that was disappointing, but it was also educational. And where I went from there was then just to make one-to-one -one links, starting with Annette and Ostcham and um, other, um, other peers who were prepared to engage, and we did it bilaterally. Um, do we do enough? We do not and we need to find ways to do more. I mean, this is something that Kate and I spend some time talking about. It's very important because none of us can cover everything. Um, Michael and I had a chat yesterday about leveraging SMF's ability to help companies in Singapore uh, take advantages of government grants that allow their employees to increase or expand their capabilities. So, you know, wherever there is an opportunity not to reinvent the wheel mm. and where um, it would benefit the members of mm. both or more, two or three chambers, then we should do it. But everything depends on building that relationship mm. with your opposite number, then building trust yeah. before you can build further. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. Uh, I'd like to <coughs> comment on the subjects of attrition uh, membership in TACs is discretionary expense. Okay, we, I mean, all of us are in luxury like SPF, Singapore Business Federation, where it's <laughs> mandatory requirement. They're not here, so I, I can uh, comment. Yeah. So, <laughs> so we're the earn of keeps, yeah? We're the earn of keeps. And the way uh, we do it is uh, we're to make sure that, uh, as alluded by some of the panelists here, making sure that we're relevant. By relevancy here, we have to provide services that's, that will help them. Okay, not any sort of uh, services, you know? So what we do is uh, we actually go uh, down the road with them, uh, what we call fighting in the trenches with them. We send our consultants or not to, to assist them on the ground. Because these are days whereby, you know, these taukes from companies and so forth, they don't have time for you unless they can see concrete results. 
So we have a luxury, or, or at least we are lucky in the sense that uh, we, we have people, expertise, we have government grants to assist them through the various centers, SME centers, our Innovation Productivity Institute, uh, on, on areas like digitalization, transformation, okay, or even simple things like you know, uh, simple consulting. Among us, we have a pool of 500 independent consultants. It's under the SMF family. And these are not, uh, not yeah. full-time staff of SMF. That's why we have the resources to deploy out nationwide. Now, on the area of collaboration, I, the word is actually co-operation. Eh? I mean, we see each other, I mean, with Farhan and Shan, you know, we, we work on the SME centers, we meet together, thanks to ESG, you know, that provides the fund. Okay, so, so quite often we do dialogue and discuss among ourselves. Okay, there will be, of course, areas where we might trample on each other, but the good thing is we know each other so well, okay, that we're able to pick up phone and call. It's very hard to say that uh, there's no area of conflict. Okay? Because Singapore is very small. So there are bound to be areas of conflict. And that's where I think the, the, the acid test is the majority, the understanding that we have among us. You know? mm. yeah. But, but I'd like to, just before I end, okay, I think something that uh, in Singapore we do need to do a lot better, collaboration, okay? which we see is a bit of a, a cultural inhibition in Singapore, particularly SMEs, you know? getting together. But it's, things are changing. Things are changing now. Uh, government is putting a lot of initiatives to encourage companies to get together, to work together. Uh, but I think the pressure for the market would really force a lot of these SMEs or companies to work, work more closer together. Yeah. Mm. I think in the uh, Singapore, uh, in the Australian context, we're slightly different uh, because um, we, we, the majority of our members are from an overseas nationality in the mm. sense of the Australian. Uh, mm. So we do get attrition. Uh, but we tend to get attrition in the, the, the people side of things and not in the corporate side of mm. things. So mm. we still maintain, it's, it really is about how much the individual businesses are committing to the chamber. Uh, so if, if it's an SME and they decide to pack up shop and leave Singapore, we've mm. lost them as a member. But mm. often it's the rotation of uh, employees yeah. in larger organisations where we see a high turnover rate. Mm. Uh, if you say people are here for three years on, on average, then effectively that means a third of your membership's going to turn over every year. Mm. Um, but it doesn't mean that the number of companies are turning over in that yeah. way every year. Mm -hmm. So part of the, the battle for uh, chambers like the Australian Chamber are really around um, <coughs> how do you keep an organisation engaged, particularly when you may have somebody who is very active in a chamber is moved on to another country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Their replacement may be uh, a, a different person in the sense of a, a different personality. Mm -hmm. They may not see mm -hmm. the chamber engagement as being significant mm -hmm. or they may be even more engaged. So uh, that's one of the yeah, bigger battles yeah. is that, and you said it, you've, you're having to replace what you've lost each year before you actually get growing. Correct. Um, that's the other dimension of it is even for organisations mm. that stay within the chamber, it's how do you lift their engagement with the chamber? Because mm. the more engagement that our members have, uh, the more that other people are then attracted to join. I, th I think we have one more contribution, but I think the other important thing here, and I think it's relevant to the sort of work I used to do, and that is that um, you have to keep establishing your relevance to people. You know, you could sit in an embassy, in my case, and say, you know, the business community doesn't know how to use us effectively in their interests. Next question I'd ask of a colleague who said that to me is, so what are we doing wrong? Correct. Yep. Correct. That they don't realise we've got this service uh, available to them. Sorry, Barrett, huh? Sure. I uh, just want to share about how uh, TACs work with the government agencies. Uh, just one example about budget. Uh, normally, uh, there is a pre-discussion of budget. Uh, normally, the government will ask the TACs to find out what are the challenges in, uh, that the, um, our industries are facing and to provide them some kind of a feedback on their budget. So we work very closely with government agencies to give feedback to the government what are the challenges, how they can incentivize the industries to expand or to grow. Uh, then, when the budget is announced, it is the TACs which goes to the companies and help them to understand what are the budget implications, how they can take advantage of the budget, and that's done by us uh, mainly. So that's one. 
Uh, the other thing is that there are issues that uh, SMEs are facing. For example, manpower crunch, you know. How do you help them? And the government may have some ideas about digitalization. How do we help the industries to adopt digitalization is an example of how we work very closely and push the program to the industries, understand their issues, help them to adopt digitalization in some way in their processes. So it's part of our yeah, effort. indeed. I've got um, one just come in from a student. Uh, what are the many ways Chambers of Commerce can partner with universities like James Cook University, Singapore? Somebody want to crack that one? Uh, currently, we're actually doing that through the internship program, which is funded by the ESG for a number of years, where we help uh, instill a high learning, IHL, but these are the public IHL, the polytechnics. Yeah. They have not expanded yet to private universities huh? and place them to work in, in SMEs. Okay? And the program actually is now taken further to, to encourage SMEs to place these students overseas as well because they want them to have international experience. So we're actually working very closely. But in addition to just the passive kind of matching, you know, uh, uh, intern students to, com to, to, uh, to companies, we are now injected programs as well uh, with uh, things like digitalization program. Okay, we are, the government has appointed us to do the uh, SME Go Digital program. Uh, and we are introducing that to the interns. Why? Because the typical traditional internship, uh, this is the feedback that we got from the Taukes, uh, the bosses in SMEs. You know, these kids come here for six months. Okay? They're there to learn from us. You know? And after that, they finish a the project, not, no follow-up, nothing. You know? that's, that's feedback. So we, we are trying to enhance that to arm these, these uh, students okay, with um, toolkits uh, that they can apply and introduce to companies and so forth, you know, solutions, and, and work together with SMF. Okay? We don't expect them to be experts, uh, but once they're in, in, on the assignment, they realize that, okay, uh, this SME is still very much a manual payroll system. And I know there's such a thing called computerized payroll system, CRM system, you know, right? Then they, they'll bring SMF to come in. Then we'll talk to the, the business owners. And after the assignment of six months internship is over, we will do the follow-up, okay? So that's how we're enhancing the point. So we are doing already a couple of years in a big way, uh, working hand in gloves, so to speak, with the IHL as well as the students. Yeah, I think to add on, I think another angle. So what is the strength of a university? It's an academic institution, so academia, research, data. So for us specifically at Malay Chambers, we, we were working with a, the, the School of International Policy Studies that's in NUS, the Rajaratnam School of International Studies in NTU. So for example, RSIS. So we actually leverage on their data and research to actually educate our businesses on the landscape in Indonesia, for example. Yeah, so that's one angle. And with the IPS, they actually, they are looking for things to study and to produce papers on. I guess that's kind of their currency. We are looking at ways that we can have good data that can then impact the businesses in a proper way rather than just anecdotes and conjecture. Mm. So for example, what we did for the Ramadan Bazaar project is that we worked with them together and crunched the data together. So we had, we, they shipped the survey um, we work together and looked at the questions that should that should be asked, so that it elicits the responses and the things that we want to see. And yeah, that's how we work together to actually operationalize it into actual outcomes for for the chamber. So for the Malay chambers, I think we look at the other angle of how do we leverage on the core competencies of an academic institution. Yeah. Uh, one point on on the, to answer the question about how can you know students engage or universities engage with chambers. Many universities, including this one, are members of chambers. Um, and that means that faculty, students are all um, available or all have the opportunity to join, join activities, events, provide insights, provide uh, input, um, which would be very welcome. And we work with a number of universities and polytechnics on that basis. Um, I just want to answer the earlier question on, um, you know, how do chambers um, work regionally? Mm. Um, <clears throat> we don't. In, a, in the case of SICC, we're a single country chamber. But the, the model that I think I'm most impressed with is that of the Indus Entrepreneurs, or TIE for short. As the name suggests, the genesis of this group was a group of um, 
uh, IT uh, engineers working in Silicon Valley, but originating from South Asia, and they came together originally, <coughs> originally for security and numbers reasons, but they've since grown and expanded their network so that they have chapters all over the world, including one here in Singapore, and they're able to provide businesses with you know, soup to nuts, everything from um, advice to entrepreneurs, access to angel investors, access to venture capitalists, and they're able to do it globally. And that, I think, surely has to be the model for all of us to emulate mm. in one form or another. Um, and I thought I'd just drop that in because it yeah, really is a you. fantastic model. Yeah. Maritam. SICCI has an MOU with uh, James Cook University. We signed an MOU uh, a month ago. Uh, but I just want to give you an example of another MOU which we have signed with the Republic Poly. Uh, when we started embarking on uh, digitalization program, uh, we wanted uh, pilot projects. So we signed an MOU with Republic Poly to help mer Indian merchants within, within the Little India to adopt digitalization and the students come up with a project to help, help the uh, merchants in a very small way. So there are collaborations that we could do with uh, universities and I think we are in discussion with uh, James Cook University how some of your students can participate in our mega events and help them to understand how to organize events in a big way. They can also become ambassadors for the chamber in promoting industries, uh, you know, and so there are many things that we can work together. Mm. I think we're being wound up. I think if there are any questions that people have asked um, that you don't feel have been answered, I think we're going to be around for a little while. Um, I, I just make one point, and I know that colleagues from James Cook University, in, including our dynamic new um, DVC here, are about to uh, speak to wrap up. But I, th I think I regard James Cook University at its best when it is uh, responsive to the needs of the community, including the business community, not just reactive. And that's a very important difference. And if universities aren't able to understand that and get with that, then there may not be much hope for others as well. But um, I think that's true of James Cook University's presence here and also in Australia. That's the expectation we have of ourselves and um, that we want people to keep us up to. What a terrific conversation. Uh, but can we all give a round of applause to, to John, to Victor, Dr. Tang, Azrul, Barathon, and our, our Chancellor, uh, Bill Tweddle. Uh, we'd like to close uh, with our new uh, DVC, who would like to give a closing address uh, talking about some of these issues that uh, we've discussed today. So if I may, invite uh, our new DVC, Chris Rudd, to the stage. Thank you, Wes. <coughs> so a, a big thank you, in fact, to Wes and Jacob and Chancellor Bill and all of our distinguished panelists for providing us with such a stimulating hour and a half of uh, thought leadership because that's really what it's been and you know the word that I heard most of all was relevance and, and that's a big word for all of us because you might be fighting in this kind of snake pit with 376 other chambers but you know think about us we're doing the same thing with here in Singapore 300 odd private providers and then n times that in the region and so we've all got to stay relevant as, as any any business has anywhere and and you know competition's good you know it keeps us fresh it challenges us it makes us more innovative it makes us more creative and, and it's fun and so you know we face exactly the same issues about the changing environment as well you know I remember it must have been 25 years ago. Uh, our then Pro Vice Chancellor for Infrastructure telling us that it was time to start dismantling the library because there were only going to be e-books and e-journals and nobody, nobody would want those learning spaces anymore. And, and just how wrong was that? They told us, um, who was the guy who wrote An Avalanche is Coming? One of the 
uh, New York State University president predicting that we wouldn't need physical campuses anymore. And, and that was only five years ago. And we're still fundamentally a campus-based university and still providing that high-quality experience which is about working with people and being taught by human beings. And yes, you know, we're augmenting that with technology and online learning may su suit students in, in certain niches, but, but still getting students onto the campus and into the classroom and engaging with each other is what a university is about. And of course, a university is also about providing a neutral platform to have this kind of intellectual debate. And it's something that I pledge to all of you that we'll do much, much more of because the JCU team, my predecessor, and all of our friends and supporters out there in business have provided us with this fantastic platform. Terrific infrastructure, great business model, very innovative business model, a terrific brand, a terrific branding. <laughs> and it would be absolutely criminal not to take it to the next level. And, and I hope very much that that's something that we can all buy into because being here in Singapore, for, for me, is, is very invigorating because the, the business opportunities and the business engagement opportunities are, they really must be the best in the world. Because I can't think of anywhere else where you could pick up the phone and within half an hour have so many high quality people who only got to jump in a cab and, and dash across town. And, and we must tell more people about that and bring more people in to take advantage of it. Um, we've had fantastic support so far. I hope that we will continue to get that great support from individual business partners, of course, from the chambers, and, and of course, from JCUA, who in the six or seven weeks that I've been here have been hugely supportive. I haven't quite yet made the transition from Dr. Martins to R.M. Williams, but I guess <laughs> it's only a matter of time. We've got a great team here from Townsville and Cairns, and I'm very grateful for the friendship and support from Cam and Trish and Nola and Stephen. Um, any connection between their presence here and the Rugby Sevens over the weekend or the Singapore Boat Show is entirely coincidental because they're going to work their socks off at graduation tomorrow. And I look forward to that very much. My first graduation here in Singapore. And I know that I will see several of you there. So thanks for coming. Thanks for the wonderful intellectual contributions. And enjoy the networking. <laughs>